milk. It's the elixir all mammals feed to their young. Deep inside the National Zoo in Washington, D.C., a team of scientists are devoted to unlocking the wonders of the white gold to help animals like baby Fiona. But more on that later. Welcome to the world's largest collection of exotic animal milk. Okay, let's get to it. Meet Dr. Michael Power. Can I call you Mike? Sure. Okay, Mike, what do you do here? I'm the curator of the Exotic Animal Milk Repository at the Smithsonian's National Zoo. It's the largest by a species count uh, number of samples of milk in the entire world. We have samples that have been collected from all over the world that we keep in frozen storage. Animals like... Armadillos, bats, giraffe, giant anteater, Asian elephant, African lion, cheetahs, tigers, sea lions, and zebra. I hate to ask, but how do you get the milk? Well, I'll let Batang show you. Batang is a critically endangered Bornean orangutan. And this is the classic collaboration between a scientist and the animal care staff. Their incredible work and effort at be able to training the animals to be able to accept this procedure to where they voluntarily donate samples. So now that we know the how, we have to ask why? The exotic mammal milk repository serves two critical purposes. One is basic science and simply trying to understand, in a sense, the origin of milk. And the other is a very practical, pragmatic purpose in the fact that we have to occasionally hand rear animals and therefore we have to come up with a milk replacer formula. Okay, so when a baby can't be fed by their mother, you guys help come up with a formula that's as close to the mother's milk as possible. Have you heard about baby Fiona at the Cincinnati Zoo? She's the baby hippo who stole in the hearts of people all over the country. Baby Fiona was born six weeks premature. She's a Nile hippo, and no other baby hippo had been hand raised in North America. And so we needed to put together a milk formula to be able to feed her, to have her grow. So we worked together with the exotic animal milk repository at the National Zoo to come up with a formula to feed baby Fiona. So how's Fiona doing now? Milk is almost removed from her diet. We are very happy that baby Fiona is happy and healthy and growing very well. Awesome. Back to Mike. So what's next? The milk repository has samples from over 180 species of mammals, and that sounds pretty impressive, until you realize that there's anywhere from five to 6,000 species of mammals. So we have only sampled maybe 3% of the mammals. It's still only a tiny tip of the iceberg compared to what we could be learning. So we have about 500 venomous snakes in the serpentine. A bite of any of these venomous snakes could kill you. That's why we're working here. We are collecting venoms to prevent that. My name is Aaron Gomez. I'm the coordinator of the serpentine. So this is a Central American coral snake. You get bit, you can't stop breathing and die. This is a new tropical rattlesnake. If it bites you, you can die after several minutes. So it's estimated that around 800,000 to 1 million people are getting bitten by venomous snakes every year. We need the snakes in order to produce the anti-venom. There are not many labs making that anti-venom, just like six. We estimate to produce around 100,000 vials per year. Ta-da! So we handle the snake, we apply some massage in the, in the muscles of the head, and then we collect the venom in this kind of special flask. Then we process the venom, we freeze dry, and then we collect the venom in powder form. And that venom is going to be used to, to produce the anti-venom. If you get bit by a viper or a coral snake in, in America or in Central America, the, chan the chances that you're getting anti-venom produced by institute are very, very high. So this is terciopelo. And this one can kill you, like drop that kill you. Most of the people just fear the snakes. Let's say that I'm not afraid, but I have respect for the snake. And you've never been bit. I never been bit, thank God. In my 
work, I really try to reproduce smell scenarios for different purposes, be it a street, be it a neighborhood in a city. I've done thousands of smell all over the world. Could we, on behalf of a smell molecule, find out something about history that we otherwise wouldn't know? This is Cecil Tolis. She is many things. An artist, a scientist, but more importantly, a smell expert. She, however, prefers another title. I call myself a professional in-betweener. Which means what exactly? There's a whole world to smell and a whole world to educate how to smell, so you cannot just limit yourself to one discipline. Right. The point is, she has dedicated her life to the sense of smell, what it means and how it can be used to better understand the world and each other. Pretty early in my life, I started to ask questions. Why are we only understanding the world on behalf of how the world looks like? What if we start to use the other senses more appropriate for the same purpose? Off I went, starting to discover the same world I've been looking at for several years, using the nose for the purpose. So how exactly did you go about recording and then reproducing these smells? I would walk around, identify smells with my own nose, I have small devices that enable me to collect the smell molecules emitting from the source. With the result, I go to my lab, and then the data I get back is then the starting point of reproduction of the actual smell. I have a lab consisting of up to 4,000 chemical compounds, and with those ingredients, with those compounds, I literally reproduce invisible reality that surround you full-time, all the time. Name a city, a neighborhood within a neighborhood, a historical building, or even an era in time, and most likely Sizzle has reproduced that smell, along with thousands of other scents here in her lab, with the hopes of using the findings for a bigger purpose. The purpose can be tolerance, education, navigation, to memorize, the list is endless. It's more interesting if you really start to understand the smells and see how you can use that information for a purpose beyond the smell itself. Chemistry explains literally everything that is happening around you. The dry ice is taking the thermal energy from the water. Unfortunately, I instantaneously get judged on my appearance. That is very frustrating for me. So I'm going to pick up my hot water. I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to throw it right into my bucket, OK? It means I have to work harder, but at the end, it is so, so incredibly worth it. And one. My name is Dr. Kate Bieberdorf, and I'm a lecturer at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm trying to break the stigma of what a stereotypical scientist looks like. So my thing is I am not wearing a bow tie, I'm not wearing suspenders, I don't have some frumpy cardigan on. I'm just some regular girl who likes to play with fire, and I also really like designer shoes, and that's okay. As the alginate hits the calcium chloride, the alginate would prefer to be with the two plus charge calcium instead of the one plus charge sodium, and what happens is we form gummy worms. Doesn't matter what you look like, any human can be a scientist. I definitely try to use energy and excitement. I love this one. <laughs> I do my best to try to reach students that might be intimidated by science. I use anything that will make the 483 students sit up straight and actually listen to the words coming out of your mouth. As soon as I've exploded something in their face, I have their attention for just 60 seconds and I can do whatever I can to shove that knowledge right into their brains. Ah, yay! <laughs> okay, so what we're gonna do today is doing some chemistry. We're gonna do three different hands-on experiments. I find chemistry to be an incredibly challenging topic. Pour your water, pour your water. Beautiful, now keep watching, keep watching. I'm so sick of the stereotypical female scientists, and we can do things other than biology, by the way. Chemistry, physics, engineering, we can do it. Look at what you made! The fact that I've been able to master it, but then use science to start the conversation, but then physically stand there and break that image, it's the most rewarding thing I could ever do, ever.
The Harvard Brain Bank is one of the largest brain banks in the country. At the moment we house approximately 5,000 brain specimens. My name is Sabina Beretta. I am the scientific director of the Harvard Brain Tissue Resource Center, which we affectionately call Harvard Brain Bank. Our mission is to collect brain specimens, store them, characterize them, and then redistribute them out to investigators across the world. They do research on the human brain, and in particular on large number of neurological and psychiatric brain disorders, such as uh, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, Parkinson, Huntington, and many others. The Brain Bank never sleeps. We have two sets of people that are on call 24-7. We have a very limited time window from when the person passes away to the time we need to be done with this whole processing. So this is going to be your first brain late at night, right? I know. First late at night. We have to do it in less than 24 hours. Our courier will bring it to Hi, McLean guys. Hospital, to the Brain Bank. So just put it out here, so we're going to take ourselves. There will be a dissectionist ready to dissect the brain. That involves separating the two hemispheres. One of the two hemispheres is put in a solution that preserves it. The other hemisphere will be dissected in thick sections and those will be frozen. We are not even close to understand a lot of what we take for granted. Our thoughts, our instincts, our feelings, our emotions. There are a lot of questions we still don't know and a lot of our brain functions still will probably be studied for a long time to come. A brain donation is, in a very concrete way, a gift of knowledge and it cannot be done without the help of families and people willing to donate their brain.